There are so many of you. <laughs> I love it. Very excited to come out tonight to talk to you about my favorite topic in the whole world, which is puppets. Maestro, if you would. The number one question I'm asked is, how did you get into puppets? My face usually looks like the green guy here. While there was a time I didn't build and perform puppets, there's never been a time that I wasn't into puppets. And I'd be willing to bet that you were also all into puppets too. For example, can you help me complete this song? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes, Sesame Street. <laughs> Thanks to the work of Jim Henson and company, at least three generations have grown up thinking that this is what puppets look like, and they should. In 2003, I was asked to help create a puppet program for the Equinox Children's Theater. Using a commercially available puppet pattern, we built our stable of puppets and we continue to write new children's plays for them to this day. Puppeteering, man, it's a life. There are few things as joyful as performing puppet shows for children. Children are not cynical. They have an innate and unyielding sense of right and wrong, good and bad, winners and losers, and they loudly laugh and cheer at the most cartoonish puppet pratfalls. We hold puppet meet and greets after our shows, and young children in particular save all of their delight for the puppet. You, the puppeteer, are pretty much chopped liver if they even notice you there at all. <laughs> Little known fact, if you hand a rod arm puppet to a child, that puppet will eat his own hand within 30 seconds. <laughs> 30 seconds, I've never been proven wrong. In 2011, the Equinox Theater was transitioning to what would become The Verge, and we thought it was the perfect time to make the leap to the main stage. But we had to go back to the drawing board because an adult audience is cynical, and you have to work a lot harder in order to convince them that puppets are not just for children. Shadow puppetry is probably the most ancient form of puppetry. I personally believe that it's probably as old as campfires on cave walls. Shadow puppets are a brilliant way to convey grand myths and stories because they're limited only by what can be drawn. You could say this is the first animation or special effect. Bunraku is the Japanese art of rod puppetry, using three to four puppeteers to manipulate a single puppet with emphasis on emotional movement. Theatrical lighting keeps the focus on the puppet, and the puppeteers are shadow ghosts in black. We knew we didn't want to use a puppet stage any longer, and we seriously considered using a form of bunraku, but make no mistake, this is a serious art. And while we're committed to what we do, we are very bad at being serious. <laughs> we considered the Renaissance art of glove puppetry, such as Punch and Judy shows. This features the wily coyote style slapstick that tickles our aesthetic. But these puppets have a very limited mobility and are, are on a small scale. So we opted to keep just the spirit of this. Puppeteers are often asked if we work with marionettes. Marionettes have eerily human movement because the suspended puppet isn't a slave to gravity. To paraphrase a famous essay on marionette theater, the force lifting the puppet is always greater than the force that draws it to the ground, which gives the puppet unworldly grace. Many have theorized that puppets capture human attention because they are uncanny. That is, they are approaching human, but not quite there. The differences sharpen the human eye to the puppet, and that attention allows us to marvel at its human-like successes. Somewhere on that spectrum is the uncanny valley. That's the place where the puppet is almost too human and can instead inspire disgust like ventriloquist dummies, but maybe that's just my opinion. <laughs> we had a lot of inspiration to draw from, but ultimately we settled on a large scale version of our existing puppets. Now the first problem with this was that large puppets take a long time to build, forcing us to begin rehearsals with puppets still in process. The second problem we encountered is that large puppets use a lot more material. We had made approximately two rough puppet shapes with five more to go and we had completely expended our budget. We ran what was ultimately a successful Kickstarter to buy foam and materials and thanks to you, the community, and your generosity, we went to town and when we were done hot gluing these shapes, we had no fingerprints left. <laughs> this is the final design. It's a glove puppet in that it has a mouth worked by hand. It's a rod arm as its limbs are manipulated with sticks. There are shades of Bunraku as the puppeteer is present but recedes by dressing in black. And it is a marionette technically because it's suspended from our bodies. This doesn't exactly give them unworldly grace but they do have a little bounce. We freeformed each of our puppets with a wonderful range of body shapes that we use to create characters unique to each show. By some strange coincidence, the puppet often winds up resembling the actor. <laughs> Which is fitting because actually these puppets are very much like our children. We continue to create productions for our puppets because we, the builders, gave them life. They are not meant to be shut away. They are meant to talk and breathe and dance and live. 
Second little known fact, if you give a rod arm puppet to an adult, within three minutes, that puppet will commit an intimate act of self-abuse. <laughs> I've never been proven wrong with that either. But because we do comedy horror shows at Halloween for adults, we are also constantly trying to find unique ways for our puppets to die. The advantage of puppets over living actors is that they have fewer physical constraints. They can be eaten by blob monsters. They can have dramatic car crashes and be flung about the stage. So long as the puppet has life, it deserves a spectacular death, like being strangled by a mummy. While we do our best with dramatic lighting, a puppet murder is usually more hilarious than scary. We call our shows PG-13. We avoid explicit vulgarity while playing up the melodrama and innuendo because we don't want to leave anyone out of the fun. Just watching a puppet brings us back to that uncynical place we all inhabited as children, and also that uncynical place we inhabited at the beginning of civilization. While we use a projector instead of a lantern, we still incorporate shadow puppetry when we have huge mythic stories to tell. Humans are born to hear stories, our lives are stories, and puppets are perhaps the very first tool that humans moves, use to make, puppet, to make stories move. If these pictures sparked your interest, I really encourage you to check out the screening of the film Puppet that PK is presenting um, in MSU's Cheever Hall with a Q&A with Dan afterwards. Dan uses a really unique style of puppetry, very similar to Boon Raku. It's a beautiful film, it's riveting, and it's free. Please welcome my good friend, Petey.